Hello, everybody. Today, I am joined by Rick Horton, founder of the Outlaw Brewing Company. Rick isn't a new face in CBP. He's active in the comments, has also been a panelist on past conversations discussing breweries with Airbnbs and small town breweries strategies for success. Following our last panel, Rick shared that he regularly speaks to university students about entrepreneurship. Giving back and sharing his story is something very important to him. I'm excited to have a conversation today with Rick about his journey, why he loves speaking with future entrepreneurs, and what he's learned over his business career. But Rick, you know, to start, how's everything up in New Hampshire? Well, it's a little warm today, and it's finally not raining. Uh, I can tell you that's been a been a challenge for us. We're an out, mostly an outdoor venue, and the rain has just made us work real hard to to uh, to make it all work. So let's have everybody close their eyes right now and describe to us what the Outlaw Brewing Company experience is like. Well, it starts out as this little tiny brewery in somebody's backyard. And uh, that was kind of the, the vision in, in the very beginning. You know, I, I knew lots of uh, farms had been successful converting themselves into a, into a brewery. You know, you look at all the ones in Vermont, they're just massive now. And that was my idea. I had a little shed in the backyard and um, I was told a one barrel system can't be a brewery, production brewery, but I had lots of hours to do it. So it's just, you pull down this rural road, there's um, hay fields on either side. You're about to get someplace where you think you shouldn't be. And then you turn in and there's this beautiful 15,000 square foot outside space with um, big white tents, event tents and umbrellas and Adirondack chairs and um, uh, picnic tables and a um, what, appears to be a small brewery, but you're actually looking at the side of it. And, and it is it is a small brewery. It's only, I don't know, um, 600 square feet or something like that. So, uh, but a food truck and um, just, you know, when you pull in, usually there's, you know, 150, 200 people just hanging out outside in it, what appears to be somebody's backyard. Wow, that sounds like my kind of experience. And I feel bad because I was up in New Hampshire last December and I didn't visit. I know. And I definitely owe you a visit. Yes, yes. So I want everybody to get the full picture. They see your brewery, but you're wearing an awesome hat right now. Tell me a little bit more about that hat on your head. Well, there's some some things that kind of happen as you create a brand and um, you become you become face of the brand. You become um, you evolve into character as it might be. I um, often go to Nashville, and when I was in Nashville. Uh, one of the things we like to do is we like to go to Jack Daniels and um, really see what their experience is about. And it's all about that tour is all about the experience. But um, there was a point in Daniels um, life that he went away and he came back dressed in a suit and was very proper. And that became what he looked like for the brand. And um, you know, th my logo is I, hop with a cowboy hat on it so i said i better have a cowboy hat so here we are did you wear a cowboy hat at all before the brewery no no <laughs> i didn't even like country music before the brewery but now i love it so so that's really what i'm excited to dive into your entrepreneurial journey so before you wearing a cowboy hat owning a brewery rick when you were a kid what did you want to be when you grew up honestly the there was a time I wanted to go into the Marines because my dad was Marine. Both my brothers were Marines. And then I was like, Ooh, I don't think I want to go away and do that. So I was supposed to be a, uh, an electronics engineer. That was going to be my thing. And, uh, then I learned, um, I was not a good student. I was more of a, um, a sometimes student. Sometimes I'd go to class and, uh, Along that journey, I ended up with a, a job in, in a car audio place and uh, playing with electronics, but selling. And that's really what I learned is that I, I knew I had the gift of gab and uh, I could sell and um, on a, a, a personal level and not a used car level. So that's really kind of what took me uh, along this journey, um, sales and marketing and then um, business ownership. When you weren't going to class during college, I suppose, was beer involved in that process at all uh yeah it's quite interesting um probably after that uh i, I was working for a company uh called cellular one there's no i don't know if you remember them at all but they were a big cellular phone company and um right about that time it was the the mid 90s and you know we were having um these you know microbreweries popping up right sam adams and harpoon and catamount and um 
Gritty McDuff's up in Portland and Sunday River Brewing Company and all these things were happening and, and we were going to, to these brew pubs and um, we were going to, um, you know, brew fests and um, uh, Pete's Wicked. That's that one that actually has inspired me quite a bit. They're no longer around anymore. It's too bad the branding was fantastic way back in the day. Um, but that's that's where craft beer uh, came into play in, in my life. And then um, my brother and I wanted to, to learn how to brew beer. So we bought some equipment, we bought a kit, and uh, we were brewing beer on a gas grill in his basement. Now, picture that, a gas grill cooking inside in a basement. We didn't die, but we actually made pretty darn good beer. Um, we got to a point where bottling was not the thing we wanted to do. We wanted to get it faster, so we kegged, and then we drank it faster than we could make it, and then we both decided to take a little break. So we took a, I took about a 10-year break in, in my brewing, and... Uh, one day my friend had all my equipment and I didn't realize how much equipment I had, but he said, his wife said, can you please get it out of the basement? He's like, either it's going to the dump or you got to come pick it up. So I went and picked it up and started brewing again. And, um, it, um, really, it was, it changed drastically in 10 years. You know, it went from, you had to build every piece of equipment from a bottle washer to a, a chiller and all that stuff to going to the store. And they had all this equipment there. And it wasn't super expensive. I was actually at a time when I could had some money. And um, so I started, you know, gathering some equipment and um, brewing was great. I brewed with a friend of mine that wanted to learn how to brew. I taught him how to brew. And um, during that process, um, I was in the middle of a, a, a divorce. And um, but he was a, and he still is um, rather well off. And I'm like, hey, let's open a brewery. He's like, it'll never work in this little town. I'm like, all right, I guess you're right. That was about 2011. And uh, I also contacted the state and they're like, mm, no, you can't do it on your property. The laws don't allow that. And so the guy said, um, the town's too small. There's, you know, Nobody's going to pay um, $10 for a six pack. Um, and I was like, oh, all right, I guess we won't do that. And uh, he comes to visit now when the place is packed with a couple hundred people. I'm like, remember you said it wouldn't work? He says, I never said that. <laughs> but he's retired now, so uh, good for him. How close is the closest brewery to you? Closest brewery to us is probably a half hour ride. So uh, I don't know what that is in miles. But um, we have one to the north, one to the east and west and one to the south, so, or two to the south. So we got, we have some breweries around us. Um, I'm proud to say that uh, we're one of the busiest breweries in, in the area. Um, most of it's because of, of uh, you know, how we treat our experience. It's not beer centered. It's really uh, about the experience and the people. You know, I say um, the people are, people in the place are uh, two of the most important ingredients of, of what happens at the Outlaw. I couldn't agree with you more. You got to make good beer and you got to have that atmosphere and engaging staff who can tell your story. It comes together and you get that wow experience that everybody yeah. craves. And, you yeah. know, whether the next closest brewery is 30 minutes away, where it is where you are or where I'm at in Virginia, where I could walk, you know, half a mile to two different breweries, I'm going to consistently go to the brewery that continues to wow me every single time. Yeah, we have people that drive hour, hour and a half and pass probably a dozen breweries to get to get to us and they'll spend you know, two or three hours with us just relaxing. And, um, you know, yeah, it's often that little brew tours start and um, either they end with us and they're like, we should have started here or they start with us and never leave. No, I love that. But a brewery is not your first business you've started. Is that correct? That's I've been I've been trying to start a business for so many years. Um, you know, I guess once you realize that you are an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur and a business owner are two completely different um different people. They're two completely different people. Uh, you can own a business, um, but to be an entrepreneur, you have to, to birth this idea and um, give it life and um, create it so that somebody else can keep that life moving and, and continuing on. So really, I, <laughs> I say my very first business um, was my paper route. I had a paper route when I was a kid and that was my business, right? I had to go every day and I had to do it and, you know, be nice to people. So they tip me on Christmas and that type of stuff. So that was my very first business. But um, then working in the car audio business, I um, I decided that I wanted to go off on my own and I 
built this mobile audio thing that I went and installed cellular phones for people or um, at, at their site and that type of stuff. And um, that was, uh, you know. Um, and when you say wrong... install cellular phones, you're talking install a cell phone in a car. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the early days. The early days, yeah. We cut holes in roofs and put antennas on them and uh, do all that fun stuff. And um, it, it was the wrong timing. And, and and I've learned that over over the years. There's there's a right time to start a business, and you have to be um, financially stable and emotionally stable to um, to to really um, build a brand. Um, after that one, I uh, started a um, uh, a beeper repair business. Um, we would repair beepers. We'd get thousands of beepers sent to us and we put new screens on them, put new uh, cases on them. And that was, you know, that was a whole craze and that kind of went by the wayside. And um, I ended up back in the, um, in the rat race and um, took some time off from trying to build my own hustle and spent a, a lot of years uh, as a sales rep and uh, national sales manager for a couple of, couple of companies. So. So I'd love to kind of follow up with two questions from everything you've just said. Looking at the businesses you did yourself, everything from the paper route to the beepers, are there any lessons that you learned? Perhaps, you know, lessons you still apply today or maybe failures that taught you something that is valuable that you've experienced? You know, what I have learned and um, my wife and I talk about this often, you know, she says that I'm a, I'm a workaholic and um, through those uh, businesses, it, life was more important than the business. You know, I was just trying to make something that could make me some money. And, um, and I, I knew that this time around I had to live it, uh, eat it, breathe it. Um, and when she calls me a workaholic, I usually say to her, actually, I'm just afraid of failing. So I'm going to work as hard as I possibly can and not be the reason it fails. And, you know, in the beginning for the first, uh, three, four, five years, um, I worked 100, 120 hours a week. It was just nonstop, and I love every minute of it. And um, you know, it was just me. You know, there wasn't wasn't uh, I didn't have a brewer, I didn't have a kitchen manager, I didn't have a front of house manager, I didn't have any part timers. It was just me. You know, and I had to mow the lawn, and we were raising five kids at the same time. So um, I just I don't know where I got all the, the the time, but maybe I just didn't sleep. So you took all that from those early days, but what have you learned from when you were doing audio sales, working for other people? Is there anything you saw from their companies that you either really respected or learned from once again, maybe their failures? You know, one of the things that um, I've learned through the years, uh, especially um, later on in life, I was uh, in the motorcycle business for almost 20 years, um, you know, doing sales and marketing and uh, helping businesses kind of, uh, streamline their what they're offering and and uh, at the end had a had a sales team but one of the things that i paid very close attention to through the years has been um how brands are perceived right what's the uh, what's the voice of the brand what's the tone of the brand what did, what does the brand mean does the brand stand for a quality product and it's this one super special item or does the um does it stand for a lifestyle and when i created the outlaw it, I wanted to create a brand that was a lifestyle. And that's what I learned um, from some of these companies. And the two companies that stick out in my mind is Fox Clothing uh, and also um, Harley Davidson. You know, Harley Davidson didn't make the finest motorcycles in, in their time, um, but they built this following and this community of people that are proud to wear the, the brand on them and also proud to say that, you know, they own a Harley or um, and that type of stuff. And that's what I build here is this this thing that people can connect with. And so many people that come up to me and they're like, I remember when we were parking over there on the lawn and there were like four seats out here. And, um, you know, they're so they're, they're like, I'm so proud of you. I'm so ha happy for you. And uh, that's that's what one of the things that I learned is is how brands are perceived. You know what? You say a couple of things there that I absolutely love. You know, it's so much about that perception and having a lifestyle brand is really important, but also having people passionate about your brand, you know, your fans who are excited to see you grow. I mean, there's so many businesses that we see grow and scale and they're obviously doing something right, but we could care less about. How have you been able to convert those people who come to say, just buy a beer into people who are literally invested in your success, Rick? Um, one of the things uh, that I've done through the years is 
I've always talked to everybody. I, I can say I've talked to 90% of uh, the customers that have uh, bought beer here. Um, I try and do my best to be very visible. Um, when I'm not here, lots of people are like, where's Rick? Um, but my people also understand that, that people buy from people, right? So if they show up for, um, they, know nothing, they know nothing about uh, how we created this. And um, we got a video there, but um, just making sure we connect with, with everybody through, through the door. I think we're all creating connections. That's 100% sure. Now, Rick, you know, this conversation really started when you reached out to me saying that you, throughout the year, talked to your local, you know, entrepreneur students at the local university. I'd love to learn how did you start this and why did you start doing this? Like, how did you begin start starting to give, you know, I don't know if you call them speeches, lectures, just sharing your wisdom with local university students? Well, it's actually, it stems from uh, meeting someone that uh, was, is a professor at uh, local university. Um, we did an event together and he just started talking to me and he's just like very interested in, in what I do and has followed us on social media and has been to, to my place. And he's like, would you come in and talk uh, to my, my business education class? I'm like, I would love to. And uh, it started with that. And then um, each year he, he me back once or twice a year and then um one of the other un universities somebody was doing a um business communication class posted on social media and a whole bunch and she said would you come and talk to my class with story of, of how you get from the idea to um to market now rick when did you start doing this uh, it's been, I think, three years now that uh, I've been um, popping into uh, classes here and there. Now, one thing I'm interested in, I know some background you gave me prior to this, is you said when you got asked to go speak, you didn't really know what you were going to talk about. How did you figure out the message you wanted to share, or did it simply come by the students asking questions? Yeah, so it really... Um, I'm, I'm real good at uh, winging it, as you say. Um, I, you know, for me, it's it's really better to have a conversation that everybody's engaged in than a presentation. And, um, you know, I walk in and they're talking about um, start talking about business. Uh, Everybody, we're going to be right broken. back with Rick, trying to get this audio situation sorted out a little bit better. Rick, if you want to connect to that hotspot, let's see if that'll help out. Yeah, let me see if I can't fire my phone up to, to, uh, to hotspot here. Uh, more challenges of being in the, um, in the country. The challenges of an entrepreneur, but though, but honestly, right now it's starting to sound fine. We can we can hear you loud and clear. So, you know, go, going back, you started talking to the students. What did yes. you learn from them? Um, you know, some of the students had uh, have or had n no interest in um, owning their own business, but they were interested in you know how it all happens. You know how it um, how you go from an idea to a brand and a product and, and that type of stuff. And that, that was really what they were interested in. And, um, you know, I, I included in each one of my uh, conversations that um, I didn't finish college, you know, life was my college and it took me, you know, 25 years to probably learn what they do in four years. Right. So life, life was my, my uh, university. And, um, you really tell them it just takes hard work. That's, that's, that's what it takes. And, and, you know, when you think you're, um, you have nothing left, you've got to give more. And um, they, they really 
I think they identify with that. You know, they identify that it is hard work to, to create uh, a business. No, indeed. Looking at some of the questions they ask you, is there anything that stands out as exceptionally memorable? Hmm. Actually, uh, I don't have any that completely stand out. Um, you know, they're, they have lots of questions about, you know, who comes up with uh, your artwork and who does, um, you know, where do you sell your beer? And, and you know, simple questions like that, but there's nothing that's um, uh, really that stands out to me. No, that, that's really interesting. So as entrepreneurs, we often work so hard just inside of our business that we don't often take a step outside and look at it from different angles. Has talking to university students impacted the way you view your business? It, it really, um, it cements the fact that we need to tell the story. Even if it's not to sell something, it's to tell the story as many times as you possibly can. So you perfect your st storytelling. That's what um, speaking to groups um, of people has done for me. It's really um, allowed me to evolve this story and add to it and um, make sure it's full and robust. And, um, you know, I tell my all of my employees, I say, we need to tell the story and you need to tell it like I would tell it, but tell it like you tell it, because you're part of the experience. And um, my son's probably the best at it because he's he's um, worked with me building the brewery from from he's day pretty one. close to the situation, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So when he tells a story, you know, he tells stories about his dad. And um, even uh, I have um, so five kids, and uh, my son, one of my sons, and two my two daughters all work for me. Um, my son, part time, every once in a while, he does our fireworks for us. Um, and then, because he's in the military, and then uh, my two daughters, one works in the tap room, and one works in the, the food truck. And um, you know, they they can tell the story because they they were here. You know, um, I missed a lot of their their life um, building this place because I was working so much. But they knew where I was and they knew what I was doing. And you know, they watched me go from um, you know carrying a case around to deliver someplace to to um, the place alive with, you know, on 4th of July uh, last year, because the weather was better, we had 500 people on site and um, there wasn't a spot to, to sit or stand or anything on the green grass. And um, they were just like, what have you done? And I was like, I don't know. I just said, we're going to have fireworks and cool food. So. So it's, it's easier for, I imagine your family to be able to share and tell your story because they've witnessed it firsthand. But when it comes to hiring new employees at the Outlaw Brewing Company, how are you getting them to be as passionate about everything you've experienced and what you stand for? So one of the keys to success that I think um, has, has helped here um, as we transition from just me to uh, a team of people that um, really are my, my the face of my brand now is I've never... Um, hired anybody. I've never gone through a stack of applications and said, okay, let's interview this person and interview that. maybe they'll be a good fit. I have recruited every person that is on my team. I have spent time talking with either my management staff or myself, you know, just sitting there watching and talking to people that are customers. Um, and they've all, that's where they've, those relationships have started. So they've had a passion for my business long before they were an employee of me, my business. My brewer, um, he showed up one day and we were in the, the little tap room that was just, you know, it probably should have had like 10 people in it, but we would fit probably 25 people in it. And um, he was having a blast. He loved um, craft beer. And next thing you know, he's coming every week and we're having a, a conversation. And I'm like, man, I need some extra help around here. He said, I'll pour beer for you. I was just looking for a part-time pour. His, I said, I don't pay well, but I, you got free beer. He's like, I'm in. So he started pouring beer for me. And then he, he became my, you know, pretty much my lead person in the tap room. And then one day I'm like, what's it going to take to to get you to come full time? Because he was a machinist by trade. And uh, I said, I need a brewer. He's like, I don't know how to brew beer. 
that I can teach you. You know the steps. You're you're meticulous. You do the same thing over and over and over again in um, in the machinist trade. So um, he's been with me almost three years now, and um, he hasn't missed a beat. And one day I'm like, hey, you got to you realize we haven't made any mistakes. He's like, I just do it how you tell me to do it, and that's how we do it. So uh, my beard hasn't changed at all. It's actually really evolved nicely with having somebody to kind of bounce ideas back and forth. So back to the original question, it was, um, I, I recruit people and that's, that's how, um, my brand has continuity because these people have a passion for, for what we do. And it sounds like once they're a part of the team, they're having a great experience. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it's a grind, right? You know, there's, there's, uh, there's times where, um, it's work and, uh, it's, just nonstop. And, uh, but there's times like in the winter where it slows down and we all take a deep breath. And, uh, in fact, last year I brought my whole crew to Nashville, uh, rented an Airbnb, flew them all down there. And we just had a, you know, five days of, um, mostly intoxication, but, um, visiting lots of things and, uh, learning the, um, Nashville's inspired me quite a bit, uh, over the years, just learning the, the, um, the mute live music piece and the experience that you get when you're in Nashville and um, this all, in, you know, encompassing thing that happens when you're on Broadway in, in Nashville. So um, I wanted them all to experience that also. Let's follow that rabbit hole. Cause there's a few things that we could talk about there. First off, Rick, are you a musician yourself? I am not a musician. I um, picked up a guitar a few times, tried to teach myself and uh, I just, you know, I wish I could, I do a lot of things. That's one of them. Where did the fascination with Nashville, the music scene there, incorporating that experience component into the outlaw, you know, come from? Um, so music's always been important. And I had a, uh, a friend that has um, passed away, but um, he helped me create this live music uh, piece here at the outlaw. And um, my wife and I needed to go down to a, a wedding down uh, near Nashville. Uh, so we spent a couple of days in Nashville and, um, it just hit me. It hit me straight on. And I said, this is what we've got to do. And uh, I also realized that my setting, my branding, everything fit um, country music. And um, there was a, uh, he's now my house musician, Heath Lewis. He popped in one Valentine's Day. Um, um, and it's a, that's a, another funny story. Like, I, I guess I'm a storyteller. I might not be a musician, but I'm a storyteller. Um, it was a Valentine's Day. It was snowing out. And one of the things that I am a uh, stickler about is we never close. If our hours say we're open till 9, we're open till 9 o'clock. Unless, like, it's a state of emergency and nobody, they're saying, do not go out on the roads, blah, blah, blah. But we stayed open. It was just me and my brewer. Um, and he wasn't my brewer at the time. He was just a, a tap room guy. And um, this car pulls in. It's snowing like crazy. I'm like, well, maybe we'll get one customer. And they were calling the phone. And we don't answer our phone. Like, I even on my answering machine, I said, don't leave a message. We, we won't check this thing. Just send us an email or send us a, a Facebook message. That's how we communicate. And um, so they ended up coming in. And uh, my brewer knew who he, who he was. And uh, I hang up uh, guitars in my tap room. So if you come in and you can play a couple of couple of songs, I'll buy you a beer. And uh, he came in, and I still have video of it. And he started playing, and I was like, oh, you have to play for me. And um, that was really the birth of um, live music and, and my passion for live music. It just the place felt alive. And um, even though it was empty, it just felt alive. It had a, had a life to it. So um, we've really focused on that. And this year we've, we've, got, uh, we've already had one music festival here and we've got uh, one in a, in a week and uh, then one uh, in the fall. So um, we're really pushing to, to uh, work on our, our place as a, a music venue. Do people travel for these festivals or are they just local events where people come together? And, you know, are they ticketed events? Tell me a little bit more about these festivals you're doing. Yeah, so we teamed up with uh, the local country music station for this first one, and um, it was an experiment for both of us. And um, I knew we could handle a number, and they wanted to do a ticketed event so that we could control that number. So we did 250 tickets, um, 
plus uh, staff and uh, vendors that were on site. And um, it sold out in, in, uh, in two weeks. Um, so um, there was an extra three weeks where people, you know, um, when the event happened and I told the radio station, you guys take care of the tickets. Here's the other things I need. I need you to have somebody parking cars and we'll take care of the venue. We'll make sure there's enough food for people so there's no lines. We'll make sure there's enough booze. We've got stage set up. You got a sound guy. Like all of it came together. It was almost effortless. And then we, we said we'd take care of fireworks at the end. And um, after that happened, in the background, my um, uh, kitchen manager, who also is a, a saxophonist, um, had been working with another guy for another event. And I kept telling them, we have to finish Wink Fest first, then you can talk to me about the next one. So right afterwards, they're like, okay, we've got tickets. Here's how we're going to do it. Here's all the costs. This is how much we'll make. This is, um, you know, the date that we want to do it. And um, I'm like, all right, let's let's do it. So um, we're almost sold out for that one too, and that's uh, in another week and a half. So um People travel from from all over to, to come to us anyways, you know, hour and a half, two hours away. Uh, and now we're we're bringing those people also for uh, for live music. So it sounds like a lot of work goes into making these events go off without a hitch. And, and you said it gone, went nearly effortlessly for this one. What tips and advice do you have for, for planning? You know, what strategies work for you? How do you make sure everyone involved has the information they need and is properly communicated? Yeah, I think you have to you have to start with the very very basics, and um, this is a, a lesson I learned when I first opened opened my um, brewery. Is at all this equipment in place? I got ingredients. I brewed my first batch of beer, fermented it, carbonated it. Now it's time to bottle and keg it. All I had was a small refrigerator. I had no place to put my beer. I didn't think the process all the way through to the end. I didn't start at the end process and work my way back. And that's what I do with these um, these events is I look at, all right, what do I want it to look and feel like at the end? And let's work backwards from there. And what are the things that are gonna be pinch points throughout, throughout it? And let's work our way through it that way. And my team's real good. They've, they're, they're pretty focused on their little little areas of things. And then we you know, get together and make sure we've got it all covered. And um, to, to host 250 people is really easy for us. Um, it's a regular thing here. Um, that's probably why it was so easy. We've um, just been able to, to hang in um, louder, um, longer crowds, bigger crowds, that type of stuff. And if you'd like, I can try the, the hotspot. Yeah, well, let's try that hotspot. And as you're getting that working, I'm curious, following these events, you know, how are you measuring success? I I'd love to hear the metrics that you're looking at. I mean, obviously you're selling these out, which is fantastic, but what other metrics are you looking at to evaluate, you know, how good a job you did and how you can plan for the future and, you know, other pieces of information that are important to you? Yeah, I'm just trying to get people easily kick over to that hotspot or not. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, she's not wanting to go over there. Um, so, go ahead, Rick. Everybody, I think Rick's connecting to that new hotspot. And then we're going to dive into some of the metrics he analyzes when looking at the success of the events he does at the Outlaw Brewing Company. How's that? Is that any better? That sounds good, Rick. So, talk to me about some of those metrics you're looking at. Yeah. So, um, obviously, the the dollar figure is like the the first thing you look at and um it's uh you, you want to make sure that at the end of the day you made some money and um our first one we made some money did i have a big pile of cash at the end no but was the um experience for the the consumer good absolutely and um you know the feedback from from the people while they were there and while they were leaving um, or when they came back the next week um was positive and that's that's the very first part of it all um you look at your employees and see how they handled the day you know were they um did you burn them out by trying to create this big event or 
did everybody feel like it was effortless? And that's what we got back on this one. Everybody felt like it was easy. We were ready for this thing. And um, that taught us that, you know what, we're, we are good at what we do. We know what, what we need to do, what type of staffing we need. Um, the grounds were not destroyed. Um, the parking lot wasn't full of empty cans. There was no tailgating going on. Um, it was just a solid um, experience for everybody. So uh, those are the things that really I look at. It's, it's what, what's everybody's experience, in, internal customers and external customers? I love your focus on experience and how you keep mentioning your team. Because at one point in time, the Outlaw Brewing Company, it was just you. It was your dream. It was your vision. You were the one putting it into action. What have you learned as you've added more people on your team, Rick, and become, quote, unquote, like a manager of sorts, leading people? Yeah, there's actually some some life lessons that I've recently learned. Um, you know, my my employees are my my friends, but it's it's definitely changed over time that, um, you know, there is there is a separation between um, being, you know, friends and being and turning into, you know, having to manage a company and manage people. And um, it's probably the 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 worst thing that's happened to me. And I've had some conversations with uh, some other friends and my wife about this, but um, it's it's made me realize that there is a shift to it all. And, you know, I don't spend as much time on premise because I, I, I don't need to be. And um, I think it just changes a lot of the, the, the dynamics to it. And um, it's been, you know, you always want to grow a company. Um, but when I first started this thing, it everything was fun. It was just fun. You know, I built it to be able to pay the bills and that's it. You know, I didn't need to make a lot of money. Um, as I added full timers, um, and, you know, grew the business and started to have to do some, some marketing and, um, pay for advertising and, um, more insurance and this and that, it turns into, wow, this thing really is a business business. It's not just, um, you know, it, it's, it's not just playing around. You know, I got people's livelihood that I have to take care of now. And, um, it changes the, the, um, it doesn't change the vision, but it changes the, the feel of it for me. Um, and I have to find those wins here and there to, to keep that keep that drive going. Well, it sounds like you, you really want to invest in your team. You, you took them all to Nashville. And it sounds like an amazing time. You know, why is it important for you to do things like that to reward your team? Um, you know, just going to work uh, every day and getting a paycheck or um, – even getting a bonus, you know, my full timers got bonuses and they went to, to Nashville. Um, it's about, again, it's, it's, it's about an experience, right? It's not just going to work. You're like, you get to, to be like, we went to Nashville. Like that was a, a work trip. And um, that was this, awesome thing that my, the company I work for did for me. Um, years prior, I have had, uh, and when it was just me and my brewer, uh, I would fly him down to uh, Tampa every year and we'd um, go all out on my friend's boat. And then uh, my friend would actually fly us down to Key West and we'd do Duval Street. And, um, you know, it was part learning and, you know, trying different beers and seeing different experiences, but it was really about making him feel good about working for a company that, um, you know, wants to share some of the things that, that, um, you know, that we do, what I do for fun. Right. So, um, you, it's just, that, I don't know. That's, that, that's the part of it. I like, I, I guess, again, it's back to the, that experience, experience of being able to, um, work for some, a company that's more than just a, a job you go to every day. Unfortunately, there are probably limits to how much you can take your, team to Nashville. So looking at like daily operations, how are you motivating and letting your team feel appreciated, you know, on the daily? I check in with each of them every day. I ask them if they need anything from me. Um, if I'm not on site and um, my wife and I uh, enjoy traveling. So um, I check in with them uh, over messenger every day. 
just to make sure they don't have questions or they just don't, you know, they're like, hey, when are we going to do this? And um, that's that's really, to me, is super motivating to to um, them to have a voice to, to be at least say, oh, no, I'm good. Or, hey, yeah, can you order this, order that? Yeah, get some of this or how are we going to fix that or you know what's um what's our plan here so um they're a little bit inside my head they don't want to hear all the voices in my head i don't even want to hear all those but they hear most of them so let's take the focus from everything that's happening with your staff and team on site to off site because you've grown quite a bit with the outlaw brewing company since you first launched it as a one person operation you went from a one barrel whole system wholesale only brewery that's a lot itself to yeah. 10 barrels and distributed in two states. What was that like? And, you know, how did you manage to hit those marks? Well, we've self-distributing in the state of New Hampshire, we've done for, for um, from day one. And we've actually maintained um, most of those relationships. The pandemic really uh, socked us pretty hard on, on all the tap lines we used to have. We, we had like 30 restaurants in the state of New Hampshire. And um, it was, it was, we were, just had, it was awesome the amount of kegs that we were kicking out and uh pandemic kind of stripped those lines from everybody because they were all shut down and when it went back the distributors just clamped on to every single one of them and they just fought it out and i was a little guy so uh, i kind of missed out for a little while but we're gaining them back now and um it's it's uh it's a good business for us as far as the the wholesale side of things self-distro now using a distributor in another state that's been probably the biggest challenge for my brand. Um, when we first started with them, they were just ordering every week. My brewer was going out of his mind. He couldn't keep up. They were just emptying tanks, emptying tanks. And it was in, in the winter, so it was okay because we didn't need it for the tap room because we were pretty slow in the wintertime. Um, but then it slowed. And I knew it was going to happen. I had been, I, like I said, I worked in the motorcycle business and I worked for distributorships. And when uh, a brand is new, it's hot and it's easy to sell. You just take the order and it just goes. Um, keeping that vending machine full um, with the same things every single week, which my brand is that style of a brand. My brand is a brand that um, people go to the grocery store, they buy Outlaw every single week, and that's what's in their fridge, and that's the treat at the end of the day for them. Um, they didn't treat my brand that way. And they still haven't, but I, I need to keep them so that I can continue to sell in Massachusetts. And if we go out and sell, we sell. And um, but their salespeople do not stay focused on our brand. And um, it's but I, but I get it. You know, they, they've got a book of business that um, they've got all these brands that they're expected to sell. So uh, as a sales rep, you sell either your house brand first because um, commission's better on that or. You sell, um, you know, what's new and, and fun to fun to sell, and you know, selling spark plugs is no fun, um, but selling, uh, you know, a fancy gadget is is a lot of fun. So um, that's that's really what we've learned about distributorship, and you know, we'll continue to stay with our distributor um, until the relationship doesn't doesn't make sense, and um, we're so close to the Massachusetts line that we have so many customers asking for our product in Massachusetts stores that it all it was. It was super um, easy for us to, to jump, jump across the line. No, thanks for sharing all of that. What else has evolved in your business over the past few years? Um, so one of the things that's pretty fun, and we've I've been on a conversation with you about this, is uh, we have two on-site Airbnbs, and um, they're booked 26 to 28 nights uh, a month in the summertime. Um, it is a great revenue source for us. It basically makes my brewery rent free. Um, and uh, again, there's this ex experience that the people come here, they stay, they walk across the lawn, go to the brewery, listen to some live music, bring some beer back to their room. And uh, they've got you know a brewery in their backyard and a story to tell about this brewery that's in their backyard. Uh, so that's one of the things that we've um, kind of added on and um, the other thing that's happened through the years, um, the pandemic was very good to us um, in a way that uh, I don't think a lot of businesses were able to um, take advantage of. We had enough outside seating um, that when the world opened back up again, 
um, two things happen. We're right on the border of Massachusetts and Massachusetts stayed, stayed closed for another month, month and a half. Um, and we opened up in New Hampshire. Um, when we opened up, there was a two hour wait to get into our, um, our area. And uh, we would have to take people's numbers and text them when, when uh, a couple people left, they could come in. We had, you know, hold our, our um, uh, permit of assembly numbers and that type of stuff. Um, but we expanded out to, to 15,000 square feet and I bought more lawn furniture than any man should ever buy. And uh, we just did this outside thing and just people just flocked to us. Um, at that time, we also had, uh, it was our first year of having a full-time food truck on site and some folks in town wanted to open a food truck and um, they asked if they could do it at my place. And I said, sure. And, um, you know, we came up with some numbers and that type of stuff. So um, we hadn't ever added that food component except for a um, kind of a mix match food truck that I had put together. And it was kind of, it, it worked, but um, we, we couldn't get it all approved with um, uh, the health department. So uh, we didn't end up doing that very long when, when somebody come in and have a, uh, an approved kitchen. So. Um, we did that for a year and a half or so, and then they decided to pack it up. You know, it's another another one of those situations where they've had full time jobs. They were doing this part time. They couldn't figure out how to take the leap um, going from, you know, depending on a paycheck to creating your own paycheck every week. And sometimes it's not that good. And they didn't understand the fact that um, if the brewery is open, you should be open because you'll sell food. Um, you know, they were, they had days they didn't want to work and that type of stuff. So they left, um, and, uh, at their exit, I had to make this decision. Do I find another food truck to rent from me, um, and be on site and try to run, um, the business, um, based on somebody else's business, or do I invest in a, um, in my own food truck? So, um, I decided to buy a food truck and it brought it up from Raleigh, North Carolina, brand new cost me about $80,000 to, to um, create the, the situation. But um, my passion has always been for, has always been cooking. So um, the real, the first outlaw was supposed to be a restaurant, not a brewery. And um, we were able to create a, um, a menu and my current kitchen manager, um, he knows my brand. He's, he's everything's within the focus of, of what the outlaw is. And um, he's, and he, he just keeps getting better. Um, you know, we just create menu items that are a little ridiculous, a little um, kind of a, a fusion of fair food and comfort food and street food. Like it's all this stuff. And, you know, I've had even local restaurants uh, come and say they're like, your menu is so good. And uh, so that's been a, um, a great um, addition to to our uh, our business. It helps uh, with continuity of brand between um, food and beverage. Um, but. Uh, it also keeps people here longer. And there are people that come just to eat. And that, to me, is a, a huge win. Um, boy, I have lots of things to talk about. We also no, added I love it. So what's I, next, I guess? You know, looking at everything you've added since the early days, what would you ideally like to do next as you continue to grow the business? Well, there's two other things that you should know that have happened within the last year and a half. We have, I bought a canning line, and I made the canning line mobile so that we go out and we can for other breweries. So that's another revenue source. And really my plan was to um, buy a canning line, do enough offsite canning, mobile canning to be able to pay the, the payment on it. And uh, then my brewery could use it for free. So that's been a win for us. It's actually turned into a, a decent revenue source. Um, and um, the other, other piece that we added is um, we're no, not only a brewery, uh, a federally licensed brewery, we're a federally licensed winery, and we're a, um, now a federally licensed um, uh, liquor uh, manufacturer. So uh, we have all three of them, so we can do everything. I got 16 tap lines that have um, something for everyone, from beer, to IPAs, to sours, to cider, um, to vodka sodas. So um, that's really been the important part of completing the brand. And um, yeah. I think this is a, a strong question to end on because it's been really fun hearing about your journey today. But one thing uh, you know, I've learned from you, Rick, is you're constantly thinking, you're constantly working. As your wife said, you're maybe a workaholic sometimes. So, you know, how important to you is 
continually innovating. And what advice do you have to, you know, other breweries, whether they're just about to open their doors or whether they've been around for years? Like how important is the innovation concept to staying relevant and keeping your audience engaged? It is the most important piece. We are innovating constantly. We do not stop it, whether it's with my brewer and him and I just had a, a great conversation uh, yesterday about a new beer we want to work on um, or my cook and what are we doing for, for uh, either to lower food costs or create a higher quality item um, or new items or my front of house manager who takes care of my social media and how do we engage differently uh, with social media. We do a, um, a trivia night and um, you know I'm like let's put some of questions from the, the previous so that people know what kind of questions are, are going to come. And trivia has been, been fun because I created trivia and, I, and we do it differently than anybody else does. We have a different host every single week. So um, each host has kind of their own following. And next thing you know, you, you, you grow this um, audience of people that just start showing up, whether it's because they know the host or um, they came last week and they're like, oh, let's see what next week is. Um, so innovating is, is super important. Um, but one of the things that I have learned in the last year um, that is my biggest piece of advice, and this is kind of how I, I end the conversation with, um, with the classes that I, I talk to. Because, um, you know, everybody talks to me about, oh, th there's a bit of luck involved in, in creating a, a brand and a, a successful business, but there's a lot of hard work and uh, there's a lot of stress. Um, you can't uh, do this without a, a massive amount of stress. And um, last year, right about this time, um, I figured out that I had some blood sugar issues and I needed to change um, my diet and my lifestyle. And, um, you know, blood sugar can spike for many reasons. Um, so I changed my diet and um, that worked well. I got, got my blood sugar under control. Um, and then the next piece was like, well, I haven't, I don't really work out. So life isn't keeping me fit anymore. So I gotta start working out. And I, I lost 50 pounds. And um, this past winter, the stress level was so high. I had just hired another uh, full-time employee. Um, cash flow was really tough. We used a lot of our cash reserves to, to make it through the winter. And um, economically, some, you know, there was a lot of pressure economically. And I think the spending was uh, a lot different. Weather was a little, weather pattern wasn't helping us either. And um, if I didn't have diet and exercise, I would have never survived the stress. I would never have been able to keep a clear head or stay healthy enough to do it. So um, what I tell, t tell people is you, you really need to take care of yourself. And um, because if you don't take care of yourself, you can't, um, if you can't think clearly, you can't drive the ship, um, you're in survival mode all the time and um, you'll never ever get past it or get out of your head. So that's probably my biggest piece of advice. Yeah, that, that can't be said enough. Taking time for yourself, whether it's just simply disconnecting and watching a show on Netflix, whether it's working out, putting your health first and your family there is extremely important for, you know, not just entrepreneurs, but, you know, everyone on your team. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Rick, as we close out, is there one final piece of advice that you would like to offer to everyone listening today? Chase your dreams. Just keep doing it. You know, don't let anybody tell you you can't because... Um, in my vocabulary, there is no, I can't, it's just, how am I going to do it? No, I love that Rick. And, you know, I may be heading up North at some point this year, or early next. So I've got you on my roadmap and I'm very, very excited to meet in person when we do. And thank you so much for sharing your story today. It's great. I appreciate uh, you uh, listening to me talk so much. Love it, Rick. See you soon. Uh, Cheers. Thanks.